Hello and welcome to another video. In this video I will be sharing with you my favorite, favorite books of 2020. Uh, I've already made a list of worst books of 2020 and now it's time to make my favorite list. So in this list I have 14 books and I'll be going from the 14th favorite to the first favorite, which doesn't really make sense because if I'm calling them my favorite, they are my favorite. I'll be talking about, you know, books that I've enjoyed from least to most, although they're all my favorite. I'm really taking this enjoyment element into account when I'm assembling my favorite books, of course. And at the end I'll mention um, a reread, which uh, is not in this 14 book list, it's the 15th book, which was a reread and it's it continues to be my favorite, all-time favorite trilogy. So um, this I will mention like as an extra at the end. And first I want to start with the 14th favorite book or my favorite book um, that is The um, Elements of Eloquence by Mark Forsyth. This book definitely taught me a lot. This is why it's one of my favorites of 2020 but I can't say I enjoyed it or was obsessed with it the same way as I can say um, for fiction books. So it's on the 14th place. It's called Elements of Eloquence. It's actually breaking down the elements of rhetoric. It's teaching us how to write, how to make our writing better and how to make it sound better actually. I read a lot of blogs and books about writing and these books usually focus on world building or character development um, plot, stuff like that, it never really takes into account the prose. The prose when I'm reading is the most important aspect to a book. So I'm really trying to improve my own prose and this book really breaks down these elements of rhetoric, it really teaches you how to make your sentences sound nice to the ear. For example, Shakespeare and all of these past authors that we still love today, they had talent of course, but they also were thinking about rhetoric and how to write a good piece of poetry or prose as well. And this book really um, focuses on this aspect of how to write a sentence, not just how to uh, develop your plot or characters or world building, it's going really in depth into the prose itself and the poetry itself and why some of the famous lines are as good sounding as they are. So this is definitely one of the best books that I've read this year because of this reason, because it taught me a lot and it's definitely a book that I will be rereading. So the next book I've actually listened to on audiobook and it's been quite a few months since listening to this book and it's always so hard to invite the emotions you had about a book right now at the end of the year when you're making a list. I mean for me it's always this hard because the books that I've read recently are still so fresh in my memory and the books that I've read at the beginning of the year I know that they are my favorite, that I had the same feelings about them, but right now when I'm thinking about them it's like I love them, I remember loving them, but I can't re-experience this in the same way. So the book I'm talking about is Someone Who Will Love You in All Your Damaged Glory by Raphael Bob Waksberg. So this book is actually a collection of short stories and it is a pretty short book in itself. I typically don't like short stories, I don't read them, I just can't connect to the stories when they're short. I prefer like five, six, seven hundred pages of a book where there's characters and a plot line so I can connect and be obsessed with it. In short story collections that's not possible for me. However, I did give this a chance, I listened to it on audiobook and I really really ended up enjoying it because it is not your typical short story collection, it is so surreal. Every story has an element of some supernatural element that uh, ends up playing really well into the whole story and connecting to our world and our reality in a way. Um, these stories are definitely allegories and social commentaries for our own world, but they're done in such a surprising, unexpected way that I just ended up enjoying it so much. And I have to say, since I listened to it on audiobook, the voice actors were so good and they're definitely also a huge part of why I loved this short story collection, because every person uh, is played by another 
voice actor, so we have real conversation. It's, it's like I'm, I was listening to a podcast. But besides that, I was also emotionally invested in these short stories. As I said, it's really hard for me to get invested in short pieces of fiction because I need time to connect with the characters, but these short stories managed to pull me in so nicely and I was just brought to tears by some of the stories, to be honest. I've listened to this while I was like cooking lunch and stuff and I would cut the onions, but the crying would be from these stories, not the onions. This is how um, it, it really made me feel things. So I really, really recommend you to listen to this or read this short story collection because it is just amazing. It is so surprising and I'm speaking from the perspective of a person who doesn't really like short story collections, so give it a chance. Next up we have a classic and it is The Outsiders by S.E. Hilton. This is the book that I've been trying to read for so many years. I mean, trying. I didn't try. I wanted to. And finally in 2020 I finally managed to read it. It's such a short book. It's such a popular one and this is why I wanted to read it because I finally wanted to see what The Outsiders were about. It's an American book. It is about kind of a social commentary about the poor people and the rich people, you know, the divide between the two. We have Ponyboy, our main character, who is also the narrator, and he's talking about how the society is basically split into socks, who is like the social class, the rich class, and the greasers, and he's one of the greasers, who is uh, the poor people, who's, who are actually the outsiders. The whole story is definitely commenting on this social divide between the classes while taking us to the two weeks of Ponyboy's life when Johnny, his friend, kills a um, this rich boy and they escape. So it is about the this murder, but more than that it is about this social divide between the two classes and how Ponyboy is really pessimistic about this divide changing and how he's pessimistic about his place in the social structure. The whole book is, was really, really short short and I know it's really hard to connect with the characters in such a short amount of time but this book managed to do it for me. I loved the characters, I loved the social aspect of it, I loved how this book is still so important today. I read this book pretty quickly and I read it at the beginning of the year but I still have many emotions about it and this is why it is one of the favorite books that I've read this year. Uh, and I just want to say that the most beautiful aspect of this book was friendships. Next book that I want to talk about is the one that I've read recently and I I still have so many feelings about it. It is one of the classics as well, one of the most unexpected classics I'd say, because I wasn't really expecting to love it and then I ended up being obsessed with it. It is one of the classics that is very much still referenced in other books, in other pieces of literature, so I wanted to finally read it to know the references, to understand what other authors are talking about and it's Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. So you probably know what this book is about, it is a pretty popular classic and it is the only book that Emily Bronte has written, which um, I was pretty pretty disappointed by that when I found out because this book is just perfect. It is such a different way of narration from what I've encountered before. So we have this guy and he's listening the story of Heathcliff, who is our main character, through someone else. And we have these levels of narration. We are listening to this guy tell us the story that he heard from this woman who lived through it, and some elements of the story are then told from what this woman heard from someone else and that someone else heard from someone else. So I don't know if I'm explaining this correctly. The narration is done in such a way that we have like this levels of who told what to whom. <laughs> wow, yes. So I did enjoy this aspect, although sometimes I forgot who was telling the story, so I had to like go back and be like, okay, so she is telling what she heard from this person who heard it from that person. Ah, okay, let's, let's move on. The whole story is so wild. The characters are so evil. Their own self-interest is always at the center of everything they're doing. The, the, the story, how it revolves around the, um, you know, the worst in people. I just love it. I love following people who are evil, who aren't good. You know, I just, I don't know what it is, but reading this, it's not a love story. Some people say it's a love story, it's not a love story. It is definitely a look at human nature, maybe. This book really plays with 
the idea of what else can Heathcliff do to make himself look even worse to us than he is now. And I, I enjoyed every second of it. Next up, we have My Favorite Thing is Monsters by Emil Ferris, volume one. It is a graphic novel and I read the first volume. The second is still coming out. It still hasn't come out, I think. So th this first volume was so unexpected and it ended up being one of my favorite books of 2020. Why was it unexpected though? So first you need to know that I usually don't read like graphic novels, but when I do, I prefer manga, that is Japanese graphic novels. Japanese graphic novels are always black and white, they have a specific types of writing, they have a specific types of characters, you know, it's all repetitive and it's all familiar to me and I love how they are made. I love manga. Um, I was really obsessed with it in high school, I'm still trying to get back into it now that I'm in college. And yes, when it comes to graphic novels, manga is basically everything all that I know. Outside of it, I don't know much. However, my favorite thing is monsters. It's such an unexpected new way of drawing and narration in a graphic novel that I fell in love. Um, not immediately, I needed time to connect with it, but once I did, I fell in love with this graphic novel. My favorite thing is Monsters follows a 10-year-old Karen who is living in Chicago in the late 60s and she is actually trying to uncover who killed her neighbor Anka, who is a Holocaust survivor. So we have two narratives, basically. We have Karen, her life, her home life, which is not happy, the way she's being alienated from her peers, stuff like that. And then on the other hand, we have Anka's murder and Karen basically trying to uncover who killed her. The convoluted plot, the new pieces that keep appearing in the mur murder and in Karen's life, are just so interesting on, on the one hand, but also so real and um, emotional on the other. I loved the balance between crime thriller and just contemporary historical fiction, kind of, because it is the late 60s, but it still feels contemporary and it still feels really, really sad, basically. Since I don't really like sad as much as I love sad mixed in with other genres, this played really perfectly for me. I loved the sad parts of the graphic novel being then connected to the um, crime mystery parts so I could take a breather, so I could be like, okay, emotions, let's let them settle and then let's jump into another wave of sadness and tears. This graphic novel made me feel specific things that I don't usually feel when I read. So this is why I am recommending it and I can't wait to read the volume 2 that is coming out soon. Next up we have another classic and it is a huge classic that I've wanted to read for so long. I've wanted to try this author for so long and I finally did and I had the best of times. It's not, it's not Dickens. <laughs> it is John Steinbeck, East of Eden. I'm planning to read all of his book after having read that one. However, I did read it at the beginning of 2020, so my emotions are kind of dulled right now, but I know that I've enjoyed this book so much. And it is a huge book. It's like 500 page book. This book definitely plays on the Bible and the theological, philosophical conversations. I loved, the most important part of this book that I loved the most is how people, these characters, just sit down and have this insanely philosophical, theological conversation, although they're like farmers and normal people. I love when we have these unsuspectingly intelligent characters that just talk to each other and experience or express their thoughts although they are kind of trapped in this life that's kind of a simple, could be considered a simple life, right? But I also enjoyed the point of this book, which is pretty much the allegory for Adam and Eve, and then later Abel and Cain. We have Adam, who's our main character, and he's kind of um, married to who's supposed to be like Eve, and they have two sons, and it's really playing on this Bible themes. But I wouldn't call this like a religious book, I would more call it a philosophical one. I enjoyed the conversations so much, and the whole prose. John Steinbeck has really a different way with words. Can't wait to read his other books. It was just a really enjoyable time. Next up we have a science fiction that I read, 
this year and I read it because a movie is supposed to be coming out in 2021. I don't know if we'll ever see this movie, hopefully we will, but I read the book and it ended up being one of my favorite books ever and it is The Dune or Just Dune by Frank Herbert. This book is considered a science fiction classic and I have to agree. I have to agree with everything that's being said, every positive thing that's being said about this book. This book made me feel so much. However, when I started reading this book, it was so boring. It took me so long to get into it. It took me like almost 200 pages to get into this book. I read a review once that said that Frank Herbert has a story to tell and he takes his time to tell the story. He doesn't care about the small tricks that authors use to make the story interesting. Frank Herbert has his plan and he's going through with it. So it's up to the reader, it's up to me to either accept his plan or his story and continue or I can give up, but the story is told and the story is beautiful. With this book, I think it's definitely up to the reader to decide if the boring times at the beginning are worth the whole story. I think they are. This ended up being, as I said, one of the favorite books of 2020. This book um, made me feel so much, as have all of the others. However, this book even more so. The first 200 pages are a setup while the next 300 pages are the payoff. And the payoff is the best, the best. It was one of the best experiences of reading in 2020, for sure. And I cannot wait to watch the movie. We're following Paul, who is a boy moving from one planet to another planet where his father is supposed to like take over this whole um, part of this planet and be like, leader there. However, the people who are already living on this planet don't want him, don't want his father to be the leader, so they're planning to execute him and the whole family. And we're basically following um, Paul and his mother Jessica as they're escaping um, this situation when his father is murdered. Now this setup, this whole setup takes like some 100 pages to happen. The narrative is omnipresent kind of what, it, what do you call the narrative style where we have one scene and we can see and hear the author describing the emotions of every person in that scene. I was really annoyed with this narration style. However, once you get used to it, it's really well done. <laughs> I think the main point that I'm trying to make here is that this book definitely started out as something I would never like and then turned into the best thing that I've ever read. This is the point I'm trying to make. So I think you should definitely give this book a chance. I think you should definitely be open-minded and get over your annoyance with the narration style and the slowness of the book. I will say though that this book is very political. So when I say science fiction, it's like more, I would call it science fiction slash fantasy because it's got some fantastical elements as well. And it's a very political book less focused on the science fiction elements than it is on the like economy and politics of this new world. The world building itself is very well done, it's definitely immersive, but it definitely starts in medias res, in the middle of things. Beginning itself starts with politics and it's up to the reader, it's up to you to realize what's happening, it's up to you to kind of include yourself into the story and um, be there along with Paul and his mother and the whole family who is just yet um, learning about this new world. Basically this book takes time to love, but once you do it ends up being one of the best things ever written. Next up we have a book that I've talked about incessantly, incessant, okay, I don't know the words, I don't know all of the words. I wish I could use big words but sometimes second languages betray you. I talked about the book to my family, I made my father read it and hopefully my mother will read it as well. I want to watch the movie from this book. I've recommended this book on other social media and I think I mentioned it in, a vi in another video as well. So the book I'm talking about is The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, a 13th century Italian monastery murder mystery. And we're following Atzo and William, two monks who are 
invited to this monastery on the top of the hill somewhere far away from everything to uncover who the killer is. However, when they get there, the other the second day, on the second day and the third and the fourth, new bodies keep appearing and someone is killing those monks and they can't, they can't uncover who. The whole murder mystery is revealing or revolving around a secret library that no one has access to except like the main monk, how is it called? I don't know. The main monk of the monastery and the librarian. And there's some kind of hidden secret knowledge in the library that people or someone, a person, I don't know, um, is killing for. So it's up to William and also to uncover who the killer is. This book definitely reminds me of Sherlock Holmes because it's very philosophical and intelligent in that way, but it also reminds me of a book that's not a crime mystery thriller at all because it has so many theological, philosophical conversations and historical facts in it that I would also call it a historical fiction book as well. The discussions in this and the social commentary kind of in this is also so smart and intelligent. It's definitely like some kind of academia work as well for people who are studying medieval times or Italy or Pope versus the state. I would recommend to everyone who is interested in those types of topics. This book is just so intelligent. I don't have any other adjectives or words to say about it, except that if you like smart books, this is one such book that you have to read. Next up, we have a short novella that I read in one sitting, I think, or maybe two sittings, and I was obsessed with it. And I wish it were made into like a whole fantasy series. And I'm talking about The Sorcerer of the Wild Dips by Kai Ashante Wilson. So this novella is following a guy named The Main, I think is how you say it. And the whole time that I was reading it, I thought his name was like Damien. I am so bad with names and whatever book I read, I will forget the names. I will not know the names of anything, of, of towns, of people nothing. I'll just know the plot. So basically this book is following this guy who is kind of a sorcerer. Everyone knows he's kind of like has these godlike possibilities. And this main guy is in a relationship with this other guy who is a fighter kind of and also kind of a god. And they're basically trying to find this forest or something. I'm like this book is so confusing to be honest. It's a short novella. But still, it is so mm, confusing. And I still, I'm still, i still not sure that I understood everything that happened. I would definitely have to reread it, which I definitely want to and will. But the main point is that the prose of this novella is so wonderful. And the whole plot, although it is convoluted and kind of hard to understand, is also interesting and very, very sad and emotional. The ending is sad and emotional and it left me being very sad and emotional in turn. So I have nothing else to say about this except that I wish this author wrote more fantasy because I want to read more fantasy and I want this idea to be turned into like a five book series. Um, that's all I want to say. Um, yes, so if you are searching for something that's short and fantastical and has a male-male romance, I think this is a beautiful novella to read. Next up we have Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. It is a alternative universe Harry Potter where Harry Potter is a scientist and he's actually intelligent and he's very dark and kind of a sociopath and there's Voldemort as Mr. Quirrell and he ends up being Harry Potter's mentor and then things happen. The trio we are following are Hermione and Draco and Harry Potter. And this alternative universe Harry Potter is everything I've ever wanted to read. I just didn't know it. And then I read it and it ended up being something that crushed my soul. I cannot explain enough how much this book made me feel. It is like a 2000 page alternative universe Harry Potter that's so scientific and fun and dark and humorous and it's got everything I always want in books, except good prose. I have to say that the prose is not the best. Besides that, the whole plot, the, everything, it made me forget how much I don't didn't really like the prose. 
as I already mentioned in this video, prose is one of the most important elements in books for me. However, this book managed to make it so I forget about the prose and I just enjoy the plot. The plot is so hidden behind many levels of other plot points. So you have such convoluted unfoldings of the plot that you really end up being so confused. You don't know who's working with whom, wh who has this plan, that plan, what is the plan, is there even a plan? Things that are happening in this book are insane and I don't have anything other to say except please read this book. If there's any one book out of this list that you have to read for sure, it is this book. It is this book. It is so easy to read if you're in a reading slump. This book is written like fan fiction because it basically was Harry Potter fan fiction, right? It's so easy to read. It's so, so grabbing. It is so... Mm. And I will say one last thing. Voldemort is my favorite character in this book. He is so dark. He is so cynical. Such a villain that I loved to follow around. So Harry Potter was the fifth book and now we're going into the four last favorite books. We're going up to the number one, as I already mentioned, and on the fourth place is Nevernight by Jay Kristoff. This is an adult fantasy book where we are following Mia, who is a young assassin going into the assassin school in order to take revenge for her family's murder. The fantasy world is based on Italy, like Renaissance Italy or even Venice. And the thing that is actually the most interesting about it is that Mia is such an anti-hero. And as I already mentioned, I love reading about bad people. And she is a bad, psychopathic character. I, I know I loved it. I know I want to read the second book in the trilogy because it's the first in the trilogy. I want to read the second as soon as possible, but I want to get like the physical copy because I read the first one in e-reader format because I wasn't sure I would love it. A few elements that I enjoyed in this book was, as I already mentioned, every person is a psychopath, basically. Emotions are put behind rationality. I, I loved when the main characters think with their heads before their hearts. I loved the concept of this magical assassin school, which kind of reminded me of dark Hogwarts. If Hogwarts were assassin school, we'd have something that's appearing in, in, in Nevernight. We also had this amazing library, which I don't want to spoil anything about it, because the whole story surrounding this library is insanely interesting. Then we have footnotes, which some people hate, some love. I loved the footnotes because it's basically the author explaining things about the world so it wouldn't kind of get in the way of the plot. And the footnotes end up being little stories within the whole narrative. They're so short and so you know, um, explosive basically. They're so interesting. There's always a twist in this small short stories in the footnotes and they're so interesting and they i don't know humorous they're so humorous as well it's the whole you know footnotes end up being the, this whole thing that i really liked this book was so shocking in the end i think this is like the last thing i want to say this book was just unexpected i didn't expect how it would end i didn't expect anything basically that happened um it, it's so creative it's so new i've never read anything like it and the characters ended up being such a beautiful band of characters. I don't know how, how, what else to say about it, except that I can really see when the narrative, where the narrative is usually going. And with Nevernight, I saw nothing and it broke me. And I even watched like one other booktuber review the third book. I mean, I didn't really watch the review. I just saw that she was like sobbing her eyes out on the third and last book in the trilogy. And I'm just, I cannot wait to get to that point with this trilogy, honestly. I'm so excited to be crying as well once I finish it. So yes, my main goal with reading books is that they make me cry like I've never cried before.
that's it. Next up we have In the Woods by Tana French, which is a murder crime thriller and it is the first book in the Dublin Murder Squad series. And this book ended up being one of my favorite books because the writing reminded me of Donna Tartt and the main character, who was such a piece of shit, reminded me of The Secret History, the like the main character from The Secret History. This is a crime mystery thriller, which I don't usually read. I don't like crime mystery thrillers because they're always so predictable. This book ended up being one of my favorite because it wasn't predictable. It wasn't predictable. I, I had no idea what would happen. Rob Ryan is the main character, okay? We have established, okay? We've established that. So 20 years before our plot begins in In the Woods, Rob Ryan is a child and he has some child friends and they go into the wood and only one returns. Rob Ryan is found covered in blood while the other children disappeared forever. No traces of them. 20 years later, there's another murder of a child at the same village and Rob Ryan, our detective now, is going to investigate. And this murder could be connected to something that happened to him 20 years earlier. Of course, the biggest tragedy is that he doesn't remember how and why he was covered in blood. He doesn't remember anything from what happened to him when he was like five. And another thing is that no one in the bureau um, knows that he is connected personally with the case. If I'm already reading murder, crime, thriller, mysteries, I love when the main, like, detective is personally involved somehow into the, you know, crime. So this definitely had a potential to become my favorite, which it did in the end, and I enjoyed every second of it. The pros, the philosophical... Mm, notions, the <laughs> notions, the philosophical thoughts of Rob Ryan and how he saw the world, it was just wonderful. I loved being inside his head and reading about how he's perceiving the world. At a lot of times, at a lot of points throughout the book, I thought Rob Ryan was such a piece of shit. I thought he was so mm, not a good character. But as I already mentioned on numerous occasions in this video, I love following anti-heroes, kind of. Although I don't know if I would call him an anti-hero, I would just call him an asshole, but uh, it was interesting to see how he thinks and what he would do. The whole book, the whole murder mystery, I didn't guess it. I thought it was very interesting uh, and very surprising. And since this is the first book in the series, the whole connection like between this crime and Rob Ryan, or in other words, the Rob Ryan, what happened to him when he was a child, this whole mystery is not revealed. I will say that. So if you're expecting that this to be revealed as I have expected, uh, it's not gonna happen because this is just the first book in the series of books. I usually guess what happens in these types of books and which is kind of annoying and this is why I don't read this genre, but I didn't guess who the murderer was up until like the very last, like 50 pages or so, when they were kind of, oh, who could be the killer? We have these people. And I was like, okay, I know who the killer was. But since the prose was so well written and done, I guess, and the conversations, the dialogues were so real and Rob Ryan was so, such an enjoyable character to follow around, I didn't really mind knowing who the murderer was. I just enjoyed the writing and the world and the whole book. I already ordered the second and third parts of this series, so I just, I'm just i just waiting for them to come so I can read them because this In the Woods is definitely one of the, one of the most amazing books that I've read this year. Number two on my list is a second book in a series and it is The Us Against You. This is actually Bear Town, but I'm talking about the second book, Us Against You by Friedrich Bachmann. Now, I don't have Us Against You in a physical copy, I only have Bear Town, but I just want to say if you've read Bear Town, Us Against You is 100 times better, at least in my opinion. I enjoyed myself so much reading that book. It's basically, if you didn't know, about two towns, Bear Town and another town, which name I forgot, and their hockey teams and the rivalry between the towns due to the hockey team rivalry. It's all set in Sweden within snowy mountains and icy frozen forests and we are following many people, many inhabitants of Bear Town who are all different people, uh, different ages, different families and we're following them as they're kind of 
connected to hockey in some way and we're following their problems and how they are connected to hockey basically. There's this one character in here whose name I also forgot, I don't know, who reminds me of Andrew like from the um, All for the Game series and he reminds me of Andrew so much and I loved Us Against You because of it and Bear Town because of it because following this character was so enjoyable. I loved him to the core. And all of the other characters are so well written and interesting, but just the knowledge that this one character, my favorite character, exists and that the next chapter could be his was enough for me to just fall in love with the whole series and I cannot wait for the third book to come out this year in 2021. So please, if you've read Beartown and you're like, hmm, I like it, I don't know if I should continue, please do continue because Us Against You is just insanely good. Um, the quality doesn't drop, it goes up, up, up. So yes, Us Against You, read it. And then it's already late and I'm filming here forever. The last book, which in retrospect I, I should have talked about it first because then I could have energy to talk about it better. The first book, it's The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. If you look at my username on YouTube, you will see that it is a Starless Reader and it is because I read The Starless Sea and I loved it so much. So this is like the favorite book that I've read this year, The Starless Sea. It is incredible. It is a magical realism story revolving around a magical, beautiful, interesting set of characters and a magical library. Or more specifically, we're following one specific character, Zachary, who is a graduate student. And this whole book has kind of dark academia vibe. So he's a graduate student and he finds this book where one event from his life that no one knows about but him is written in the book. So he's like, what? How can this be possible? Because no one knows about this, what happened to me when I was a child. And this book has the whole event written in it. So he's trying to uncover what this book is and where it came from. The Starless Sea doesn't really have a plot as much as it has this magical mood, this magical vibe about it. And the focus is definitely more on the characters than it is on the plot or anything else. The writing, the prose is just wonderful. It is very quotable. It's very like something you could tattoo on your body. And I definitely wanted to tattoo some things from this book on my body sometime in the future. This is how much I loved it. This is the type of book that really offers you a meditative experience because, as I said, it's not about the plot. It's not that it's driving you forward. It's letting you enjoy the moment and the beautiful descriptions and the beautiful magical realism and the characters that are in this scene. It's not making you think about what's coming next. It's just letting you rest in this scene within this specific page which I adored so much. I read it at just the right time in my life. It just changed how I read books because now I'm really trying to focus on what I'm reading instead of thinking what comes next. And this is why it's one of the most important books that I've read this year. And this is why I definitely think that anyone and everyone should read it, but you should read it in the time when you want to read. When Because this is a book about books. And it is a book that's really slow. So if you're not feeling like reading right now, and if you start The Starless Sea, it may end up being boring for you. But if you really feel like reading, if you really appreciate every word and sentence on the page, The Starless Sea will definitely be a book that you will end up enjoying immensely. And finally, we have come to the end. I just want to mention this reread that I did this year, which still is one of my favorite book and books and series and trilogies ever. And it continues to be. And it was when I first read it in like 2016. And it's still to this day one of the favorite book that I've ever read. This is the type of trilogy that whenever I feel stressed and depressed, I read it and reread it. And it feels like home. And it is the All for the Game trilogy. I reread it in 2020 and I loved it just as much as I loved it the first time around. And I will continue to reread these books whenever I feel um, stressful and uh, depressful. <laughs> I don't know. Um, just wanted to mention this is one of the best trilogy that I've ever read in my entire life.
and it means so much to me. So this is basically everything that I had to say in this video and it is a lengthy video but I hope you did enjoy and end up enjoying and end up putting some of the books on your TBR. So I hope I will see you in my next video. Now subscribe to my channel and go read a book. Bye! So I literally waited more time to film this video of the favorites because I wanted to include the last book that I read this year which was Frankenstein by Mary Shelley and then I forgot to include it in the list. I just want to say that Frankenstein it was one of the favorite books that I've read this year as well and it was surprising uh, in the way it was written which I didn't expect from Frankenstein which is basically a horror book to be written in such a beautiful poetic way the sentences there, there's so many parts of the book that are so quotable and just wonderful and they touched my soul so much uh, Frankenstein's monster was actually my favorite character his experience was so real and relatable I think to, to a lot of people today I don't know what I'm saying anymore I just I just like I just know that I forgot about this book and I don't want to forget about it because it's so beautiful so I'm just saying real quickly perfect book the prose is so wonderful and even if you don't like horror like I don't I don't like horror but Frankenstein ended up being Frankenstein but Frankenstein ended up being one of the best books that I've read this year because it was just beautifully written and it's a short book and it's a classic and I think you should read it. So yes, bye.